I'd like to call to order the uh, December 13, 2022 regular meeting of the Board of Trustees of College of the Redwoods and ask you to join us in a salute to the flag in honor of those serving our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land on which we are gathered today is unceded territory of the Wiat people who continue to live and thrive on this land today. It is surrounded by the traditional, ancestral, and present homeland of several indigenous nations, including the Hupa, Karuk, Atoll, Tualawa, Wailaki, and Yurok that make up Humboldt and Del Norte counties. Uh, first on our uh, agenda now, 2.1, public comments. Do we have any public comments? There are no public comments. Yeah. Uh, then we come to 2.2, administering the oath of office to new trustees, which will be done by our vice president, Trustee Bingham. So we move over here to the side. Is there going to do all three of you at the same time? Thank you, Trustee Bingham. And welcome uh, to our new trustee, Trustee Petrotti. Welcome. We're glad to have you with us. Uh, member comments. Are there any trustees who would like to comment? Trustee Dorn. I attended the vice president interviews and they were really interesting, but the highlight was our student trustee. She attended all three in person and her questions were just so amazing and well thought of. I mean, I, I thought, boy, I wish I could think of questions like that. Um, so I really appreciate her time and dedication. I'm sorry she's not here today to hear this. Trustee Kelly. Thank you. Um, so I'm playing catch up because I missed the last board meeting, but I attended the 2022 ACCT Leadership Congress, um, the California Board of Governors meeting on behalf of the CCLC, and uh, the 2022 CCLC Annual Conference. I also attended a REDEC meeting, and um, I've just been informed this morning that I'm part of the Audit and Finance Committee for the ACCT now. Thank you for your support. Robertson. 
I wanted to share that I attended the um, UCLC annual conference after a nine-hour delay. <laughs> so I missed pretty much the entire first day. I came in at around five and got to see the tail end of a great panel discussion on board president relationships. So that was really um, edifying. So I just wanted to, if you'll indulge me, share a couple of things um, from one of the sessions that I attended on student success in an era of enrollment declines. Um, so this session was led by um, the Vice Chancellor for Government Relations um, and really focused on enrollment declines um, that have really highlighted some of the challenges that our community college students face. And so we've seen a lot of, we've seen enrollment declines especially around 2020, 2021. And um, they shared uh, the outcome of some research that was done by the Strata Education Network, in which they um, surveyed 40,000 students who had um, different roles from community colleges. And what they found was that the factors that were influencing their decisions not to enroll were that they had to prioritize work, um, there were not enough online offerings, um, people had dependents, they could not afford the tuition, um, they didn't know how to register, they were experiencing stress and strained mental health, and they had an uncertain educational path. And so they pointed out a number of really prominent needs um, that community colleges should be addressing, and I think that we're doing a very good job of addressing here, and that's affordability, dependent care, and flexible and online offerings, and then intensive holistic advising and mental health support. So I just wanted to share that with the board, um, and with the public, again, I feel like we're doing a great job at, at this institution of addressing those things. Um, and I think I myself feel like I need to know a little bit more about what we're doing around advising and mental health support. So, so thank you. Thank you. Trustee Biggin. Well, the, the highlight for me uh, since our last board meeting was to attend the Christie Bowl. And to see our football team compete in the um, Triple C Double A uh, playoffs, it was a really exciting game. The um, spirit of, of the boys was just fantastic. Unfortunately, they didn't quite play up to their usual um, self. Uh, I think we really should have been uh, the winners of that bowl game because they, you know, were just they had. <laughs> Beat uh, Mendocino before, and uh, not Monterey, excuse me, Monterey uh, before, and yet the excitement and the enthusiasm and the pride that it brought to our community was really special. And I wanted to pass around the program. It was a wonderful program, and uh, pictures of all of the team members and all of our high schools are represented um, on this team. And uh, I think that's really significant too. So I want to congratulate. Um, <coughs> Coach Jason White and, and his staff and, of course, the students and their families and all the support that they have given uh, to this program. Um, it's been a number of years since we participated in the fact that this first year uh, we take the team all the way to the bowl game. It's just really phenomenal. So that was my biggest highlight I wanted to share. Um, I did get a chance to um, participate in the Zoom meetings on race lighting that um, Dr. Kinsey Johnson had talked about, and I found those very um, informative. Um, many of these uh, conferences and workshops are filed and saved on the Vision Resource Center and I'm, that the, um, the Chancellor's Office um, maintains. And so I did go to that Vision Resource Center and did participate in two of their um, Zoom meetings. Uh, one was on implicit biases, um, in our college, and the other was on becoming culturally competent, and they gave us a little certificate, so I was going to hand that <laughs> in so that uh, we get credit for having some of our trustees uh, participate in, in those meetings. Um, then the other um, opportunity that I had was to observe the interviews, the forum that they had for the candidates for vice president. 
of instruction and they were all so excellent and it was really I, I didn't see the audience that was here in the boardroom but it sounded like it was well attended by staff and um, there were a number of people also zooming in so I'm looking forward to um, the recommendation that has come from the committee and uh, the good work that's going to be done in the future. Thank you. We move to board committee reports. Are there any board committee reports? Trustee Mullery. The Audit and Finance Committee met before this meeting at 12 o'clock to review the audit. Uh, this will be further discussed in agenda item 5.1. Mm -hmm. We did approve it. We approved the audit. And um, again, I'll, we'll discuss it more with that when that agenda item comes up. Thank you. Any other committee reports? Uh, we move on to 2.5, review the code of ethics and trustee protocols. Uh, we uh, voted earlier to have this on our agenda every quarter, and uh, so we, we have it on the agenda today. There aren't any changes to it. Um, uh, it is good for us to be sure that we um, review this uh, on a regular basis. Uh, if you have any comments or thoughts, uh, I would hear those. I would say that um, that uh, I was able to have in, uh, a phone meeting, orientation to the board, so to speak, with Trustee Pedrotti, and, um, and pointed out that it was good to have this on her first agenda because <laughs> it will give her an opportunity to to specifically know that this policy is there and, and tremendously important to us. And we had a good discussion about it, including on the section uh, on interacting with community members and uh, you know people that we know um, as we be, as we join the board and how you know how we um, have to think that no matter where we are, who we're talking to, we're always a trustee. <laughs> Um, are there any any comments or things? I mean, all, all I would say is I'm, I'm very pleased that we made the decision to review this periodically. Yes, I, I just think it's important for all of us to read it, and it's important for the community to recognize that we take this very seriously. Okay. And uh, I would encourage you to. Uh, Trustee Pedrotti, again, to you know, raise any questions or issues, explanations. Two point six approved uh, trustee and student trustee travel to the January CCLC conference in uh, Sacramento. Do I hear a motion? I move to approve. I second. Thank you. Um, any questions? Are there trustees who are interested in attending? Trustee Robertson? And I think Trustee Pedrotti? So, all right, so we're, now we're, we're at four. Oh, okay. No, that's President Flamer. So I, I believe we had Trustee Dorn who wanted to go and student trustee Matson wanted to go as well. I don't know if anyone else would like to. Well, that's well, so far that if it's okay. about it's six, many, we, can, we can discuss it. It's not too many at all. Okay, okay wonderful. So, uh, Trustee Bain? I, I wonder if part of this motion, um, there is a free workshop for new trustees February 13th. Do we need to have prior approval for that? Do we need to make the, the Chancellor's Office, this is the first time they've done this, is offering that? Does that need to also be part of it? Yes, it does, and it would be also very good. And and many times districts send their whole board to these okay. conferences. Okay. I I wasn't planning to go, but I'm really glad to see the interest yeah. in everybody else. So. Yeah, yeah. I might be able to go to Trustee Dorn. So this is for both conferences. I just want to clarify. Sure the back, the back, the back. Yes. Okay. So I just the back, the back. Yeah. In January. Right. Okay. All right. I think Trustee Kelly may have a 
comment? Well, no, I just was going to say to respond to Trustee Biggin's comment, I think we could probably approve the February new trustee orientation in January. But I, I think it's, okay. it, 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 I heard discussions about it from the, um, the uh, education director for the CCLC and very excited to be offering this for new trustees. <coughs> I think yeah. uh, Trustee Pedrotti would really appreciate it. We, we can add that to the January agenda. Okay. It, are they going to do the Brown Act ahead too, like they usually do? It's not on the website yet. At the effective trustee workshop? Yeah. Yeah. Well, sure. Well. Okay. So trustees who wish to attend should be contacting Julie to register. Is that correct? You are correct. Okay. So please, yep, do that. Okay. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? Uh, okay, all those in favor of the motion to approve travel to the January CCLC conferences, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. 2.7 is status of board trustees' requests. There is just President one, Lamer. just as yes. information only. We're still in the process of getting the CR history completed. Wonderful. Okay, we move now to organizational procedures. <clears throat> this is the election of officers, president, vice president, and clerk. At our last at our last board meeting, the nominating committee presented the slate of office uh, slate of uh, nominees for president, trustee Biggin, for vice president, trustee Mullery, and for no. sorry, vice president. I'm sorry, I didn't mean that. Trustee Roberts. I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. All right. I will restate. For President Trustee Biggin, for Vice President Trustee Robertson, I'm sorry. Okay. And for Clerk Trustee Mullery. Um, are there any nominations from the floor? Any of those offices? Hearing none, I would ask for a motion. I so move to approve this late. Thank you. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll bring it now to the consent calendar. Any trustee may pull any item from the consent calendar. Is there any trustee who would like to pull an item? Seeing none, could I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the consent calendar. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Okay, that brings us to... Um, uh, agenda item 5.1, except the final audit. Um, Do we have Steve? Mr. Steve on Perry the phone? with us? I'm here. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, President Flamer. The, 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 the audit has already been approved, and what's on the agenda now is for the full board to accept the audit itself. And we've asked uh, Stephen Curry to walk the board at a high level through the audit itself. Okay. So this is listed as an action item, even though it's acceptance. Yes. So okay. we, we should um, move exception to I move for acceptance. approval. And no. acceptance. 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 Okay. And I'll I'll second your acceptance. Uh, so, Mr. Curry is with us. Uh, Trustee Muller, did you have any comment from the committee at the outset or just as we discuss? Well, I'll, I'll um, make, make some comments. I think the most important comment to make is that uh, we received the, the highest type of opinion that a, a college can receive for this audit report, and that's something called an unmodified opinion, which is excellent. 
um, and it was for all aspects of the report. The, um, Mr. Curry <coughs> will, will go through the report at a high level. Um, we spent about 45 minutes discussing it in the audit committee. I want to mention, more than mention, to thank Vice President Morrison and her entire staff for making this audit report um, such that we could receive this unmodified opinion. And I, I made this remark to Mr. Curry during our meeting, and he remarked that uh, the staff here at CR, Vice President Morrison and her staff, were really wonderful to work with, that they were always timely and responsive and provided accurate information. So I, I do want to acknowledge that. I know that that staff has been understaffed for some time. I'm not exactly sure what the status is now, but I'm sure you could always use another set of hands. But I do want to thank you, and please uh, take our thanks back to all members of your staff for this excellent. Um, with that, I'm going to, um, unless other members of the committee would like to say <coughs> something, I was going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Curry to provide a high level, and then we may have other questions from trustees as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Curry. All right. Um, does everybody have the report in front of them? I was just going to go over a couple pages in the report. Um, I will say what page of the report we're on, and then. Um, we can kind of go from there. Um, I just want to start out to thank, you know, Julia and her whole team. I think it's it's a big effort, not on, not only with just the business office, but all the departments on campus, too. Um, we go through, you know, admissions and records, the financial aid office. Like, everybody has to come together to really get this audit done in a timely manner. Um, and with that, everybody did an awesome job. So we appreciate it. Um, so I'm just going to go over a quick high level overview of kind of what we do as auditors um we are an external audit firm that's uh contracted by the district to report the financials to the chancellor's office um we really what we do is we issue four opinions on the report um and then we kind of help build we we build the financial statements based on the district's underlying records so beginning on page one of the audit reports um is our independent auditor's report. So this is the report on the audit of financial statements. So this is our independent auditor's report on those financials that you would see later on on pages 12 through 18 as a whole. Um, we gave our unmodified opinion, which means we had no nothing that came to our concern and no material adjustments. We looked at everything that's material. Um, the only significant thing that changed this year is outlined in that emphasis of a matter paragraph that's just a GASB 87 that's the leases they got rid of the whole um, capital versus operating lease and came together as just one lease guidance um, district um, implemented all those changes and we have no issues with that so we gave an unmodified opinion on the financial statements as a whole um, the rest of the reports kind of set up where the management discussion analysis is a high level beginning on page four, the basic financial statements begin on page 12 and then the notes are on page 19. But I think what we'll do is we'll just go straight back to our, what we're doing is we're providing that independent auditor's opinion, which begins on page 62. Or if you go to page, um, you can go to PDF page 69. So this is our other report. So this is our independent auditor's report on the internal controls over financial reporting. So we talk about the financial statements that we just gave an opinion on. But in addition, we're also looking at the controls of the district. Um, we look at a lot of areas, just some of them, including our, the expenditure side um, for the disbursements, cash receipts, payroll, HR. Um, and then we also do look at the federal and state program. So for this, we also gave an unmodified opinion saying the district's controls were as implemented and met the standards that are required. Um, we had no findings related to the internal controls and we issued the unmodified opinion. If we go two more pages to page 64, this is our independent auditor's report on the compliance for each major federal program. So in addition to the financial audit, we're required to assess the district's um, 
major federal programs, which is based off of federal expenditures. Um, all programs over 750000 are required to be audited every third year. Um, with that, we audit student financial aid every year just because of the size of the program. And then we also are required to audit the HERF funds too because they are considered a high-risk program and they've been asked by the uh, by the audit by the federal compliance office to, for us to audit every year. Um, we also issued an unmodified opinion stating that the controls and compliance were good for all those programs. On page 67 is our independent auditor's report on state compliance. This is our audit over state programs that are provided to us from the California Community College Chancellor's Office. Every year they release the the California Community College Contracted District Audit Manual, which they list out a list of programs that they, they want us to look to make sure they're first applicable, and if they are applicable, to look at procedures over those programs. We also issued an unmodified opinion with no exceptions noted. The summary of those programs are on the next page. Those are the programs that were required for fiscal year 2021-2022. And then just on page 69 is just kind of a summary of what we do as auditors. Um, so all those opinions we just talked about, it kind of just summarizes them here, showing that we had unmodified opinions with no material weaknesses and no significant deficiencies for those three areas. Um, as you can see under the federal award section, those are the those were the federal programs that we looked at for the year. And then the pages that we're going through right now, beginning on page 78 or PDF page 78, would just be if we had findings in any of those areas, we would just have some details there. But uh, we had no findings for the year. Um, so those are just kind of, they're all gonna be blank pages that just say we're no financial statement findings, no federal findings and no state award findings. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions from the trustees? Trustee Muller, did you have any further comments? Actually, um, I do have I, it, it's a, it's a bit of a question. There, there is so much useful information in these reports. And of course, they're made public, they're on um, in our agenda, anyone can access it. But if one wanted to look at this report, let's just say three or four months from now, do we also post it somewhere on our web page? Because I might want to look back at it and I don't want to have to remember what meeting it was at. Mm -hmm. So where would we find that? You can find it, uh, navigate our webpage often. Um, if, if you go to faculty and staff, you're familiar with that, yeah. that yeah. drop-down is, and from there you can navigate to the business office. Okay. And then from the business office, navigate to reports. Okay. And that reports page has our audits, our prior budgets, our prior 311 annual quarterly. Good. That information is out there. But because, I mean, there's just a wealth of information in these reports, and it's, at least for me, it's difficult to kind of grasp everything in, in a, in, even in a careful reading. So it's one of these types of reports that I think I would like to refer back to, um, and others might as well. Um, President Matthews, Trustee Dorn. Yes, Trustee Dorn. And I follow up with your comments. And I, what I found most interesting was on page nine, the economic factors mm -hmm. that affect the future of the district. Mm -hmm. I don't ever remember seeing something like that before in an audit report. And I just been at a conference that was talking about some similar um, information. So I, I found that as a trustee to be mm -hmm. really helpful. It let, let me focus and think about what's coming up. Um, yeah. So I appreciate that. And I do want to congratulate Vice President Morrison on an outstanding job, and I, it is the best audit since I've been on this board. So thank you for your hard work. And on time. Any comments? I I would have the, the, the same comment uh, as Trustee Dorn about the information on the economic factors, mm -hmm. and uh, noted particularly the next to the last paragraph on, on uh, page 10. Um, that a fundamental goal for the district, not that we don't know this, but it's very clearly stated, a uh, fundamental goal for the district is to manage costs so that expenditure growth as we try to implement our master plan, our facilities master plan, et cetera, um, so that we can uh, control costs and not out 
outpace our revenue growth, which we hope for with building our enrollment again, um, and our need to increase our fund balance. I thought it was really a very clear statement. And the other thing that um, that I I noted because of interest and that the board said interest was uh, Mr. Curry's comment that we were doing well in uh, in uh, building our our uh, balance, uh, fund balance for our uh, OPEB, yeah. our unfunded future liabilities. And I think that that's really worth, worth commenting on. Any other comments or questions? Uh, hearing none, we are voting to accept this audit. <coughs> All those uh, in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Vice President Morrison. <clears throat> we move now to 5.2, approve the monthly financial status report. Vice President I Morrison. Approved. I second. Thank you. Vice President Morrison. I can go over the financial status report. So we can you open that, please? So this monthly financial status report is through October 31st of 2022, or 33.33% of the uh, fiscal year. We have had no year-to-date adjustments yet. As you'll see in the um, year-to-date adjustments column, we are currently still on budget as far as our revenues and expenditures go, and still on par for our ending fund balance estimate of 17.5%. And then just to kind of note um, as well that that 70.5% it is a gross over prior year um, estimate and is fund balance. But our goal is still that two months worth of unrestricted general fund, um, or excuse me, not unrestricted general fund, two months worth of, restrict, of general fund expenditures. So we're getting close to that. And if you put that two months into a percentage, it's about 23-24%. Uh, Doing? So I saw the property taxes in September. So it, the controller, the old controller, isn't there anymore, correct? Right. So every you anticipate things being back to normal then with the new controller? They will still have to do some catch up, but we have already started to see our 2021, which they still haven't had the books closed. We're finally starting to see our actual interest apportionment for that year. So and. Uh, I think that they're picking up steam on getting their books caught up. Thank you. Any, <clears throat> excuse me, any other questions or comments? Um, <clears throat> all those in favor of approving the monthly financial status report, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, item 5.3 on our agenda is district compliance with the 50% law requirement. Um, it's an information item. President Flamer. Thank you. Although we set a, a, a basement of half of our general fund is spent on instruction. <clears throat> Although that is just the absolute minimum that is our target. Um, how, how I look at it is I would like to put funds Board instructional areas that we need that are that are mission critical, where, where it means extra spending on on supplies, et cetera, but also in new new positions in the faculty. So we are driven by may, making sure that that we hire faculty in the right areas that that we get get both boost in enrollment, but also get students through our curriculum. Are there any questions or comments from trustees? We are happy, I believe, to be above 50%. We are happy <laughs> to be above 50. Just a quick question. Yes. So there's a, a minimal decline between 2019 and 2020 and 2021. 
And I'm assuming that's because of course cancellations due to enrollment declines. I'm not sure that that's the case. Which numbers are you looking at? So the, the um, 54% in 2019-2020 and then a decline of 52% in 2020. And that that was that was also a re response to retirement. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything further? We move to 5.4, approve sabbatical recommendation for 2023-24, and we have one uh, uh, sabbatical recommended for our approval. The proposal is in our packet. Do I have a motion? I move to approve. I second it. <laughs> it's been moved and seconded. President Flamer, have any comments? I have no comments. Are there any comments or questions from trustees? Trustee uh, Roberts. I look forward to this not boring. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Seeing no further comments, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. <coughs> uh, congratulations, Professor Johnson. Uh, first read of board policies and administrative procedures. Uh, these are uh, policies in the 3000s, which are general institution policies. Um, right. the, if I can make, can make some comments. Of course. You? I was just going to say that the changes had been highlighted in, uh, in the policies that are posted. So we appreciate that. President Flamer. Thank you. I'll, I'll be much more patient next time. So <laughs> I apologize for that. On, on AP 3420, we are going to... Although we, we did delete Mendocino campus, we're going to add KT to this list. Uh, but also okay. in BP 3500, we will add the campus police department before the board sees its second read. And 3506, uh, we will correct the chief of campus, I mean the chief of police, past tense to chief of police, which we'll just get rid of that D. But also in 3505, 3506 and 3507, you will see that there's some extra spaces and some lines being broken off within the document. We will clean that up for the second read, but also prior to being um, uploaded to board docs. Okay, thank you. Um, and I believe that... Um, Question? Uh, yeah, I was just going to restate what's already there in writing, that these have already been through College Council. Yes. Trustee Biggin. On 3830, oh, which is the conservation of art collections, um, we've added the It's Fine Art Collection. And I'm wondering, I'm not an English major, but would fine art be more appropriate to say than fine art collection? Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll make that change. I, when I think of fine art, I think of just, you know, like two-dimensional, and we have sculpture and... Uh, Agreed. Great. We will make that change. Any other comments or questions from trustees? Okay. Um, we will see those back on our January agenda, I believe. You will not see oh. AP... You will not... You will not see AP 3420 because it's an AP, but you will right. see all the BPs coming right. back. Right, yes. Thank you. <coughs> we move to uh, agenda f item 5.6, second read of board policies and administration and administrative procedures. And uh, do I have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second been moved and seconded. Um, we did see these before, of course. Uh, are there any um, comments or questions at this time? President Flamer, do you have any comments? No comments or questions. Trustees? Okay, in that case, all those in favor, <clears throat> excuse me, all those in favor of approving these uh, board administrative Procedures under 5.6, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. 
Next item on our agenda <coughs> is uh, the Emergency Conditions Allowance Plan update at the ECA. President Flamer. Thank you. The, the board first saw the ECA plan from the district in July, middle, middle of July. We submitted it in the middle of July and the Chancellor's Office did approve our application. And several conditions of the approval was that the board had to see the plan update, but also we had to certify uh, BP 2800 and assorted BPs and APs that are, that are related to budget. But also we had to certify that the district is well on its way to becoming a home and teaching college or DE. And also that we are up to date on our audit and as of today we are. And so we are looking good in terms of the, the update. It is due to the Chancellor's Office no later than the end of February. But I don't like to wait to the last minute to get things approved. So the board is seeing this now and, and after the t meeting today, we will send it on to the Chancellor's Office. Okay. Are there any comments, questions? from our trustees. The, my clarification, mm -hmm. the home college refers to participating in statewide open enrollment Correct. of students. And so, and so students can, can take courses from other places to from CR. And then CR will get the, the, the FTS credit. Right, and students still are able to combine their financial aid eligibility? We have signed an agreement that allows them to do so, yes. Okay, so they, what I mean is they can use units from several colleges. Correct. Okay. And, and that, that's called a, a financial aid handshake, so we did, a, we did agree to that. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, well, I, I feel that we, uh, when we first saw this, we knew we were well on our way to meeting most of those conditions when it, when the program came out, so excellent. We move on now to uh, uh, informational reports on our agenda. The first is 6.1, student success data. Um, uh, involving AB 928, which is dropping the Area E lifelong learning. And Mr. Chown is. Yeah, I'm Paul Chown, our director of IR. I, I've asked him to talk to the board about the impact of 9, yes. 928, and as, as you can very well see, that the uh, AB 928 is, is under uh, lots of conversation and. and in the in our with our sister institutions mm -hmm. and both the CSUs but also the UCs and we are all going to be impacted in some way or another by area E. I've asked Paul John to kind of walk us through what it currently looks like based on the current assumptions. Welcome, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. So uh, from my summary we're looking at Area E of the CSU I get the pattern for transfer students. That limits the scope of this quite a bit. We, we currently have uh, about 700 transfer students who enroll in uh, an Area E course every year. Now that doesn't make up all of the enrollments. We have about 1,800 total enrollments in these courses. Uh, about 700 of them are from the CSU transfer PE pattern. <clears throat> the average fill rate for these courses is about 17 students per course, per section. That's where I came up with the 40 sections. Now, um, I, there are some things I want to point out. In the list of courses, I think there's about 12 courses that we currently have on the books that we are offering. Um, of those courses, all but two 
are part of an existing major. So they would take this course to fulfill their, their major. Uh, and those, those two courses are the GS1 and GS7 courses. Some interesting uh, information about the GS1 and GS7 courses. So even though they are probably the highest enrolled of all of the Area E courses, um, the GS1 course, about half of its enrollment is from the Pelican Bay. GS7 course, of, as of the last couple of years, its enrollment has been strictly to the dual enrollment program. And can you explain what GS1 and GS7 are? GS1 is a college success. GS7 is my future, my plan, planning their career, planning their college education. Um, these GS courses aren't part of any major, so according to the chancellor's office, there would be no reason for a student to take these anymore once we remove them from a GE pattern. That's that's especially when looking at the, the students that are affected by that. I think that's all that I found relevant. I mean, I'll, I'll answer questions if uh, you have some. I think the other areas that we're concerned about are, or will be impacted by 928 or, or the, some of our classes in, in our athletics. Yes, yes. So there were maybe a couple art classes that, or music classes that, that students used to take. I just don't know what the enrollments are, but some of those lifelong type of courses will end up being um, submitted from our curriculum when this passes. So, so there's two kinesiology classes in the area E, Kin 65, Kin 66. Those are both part of the kinesiology major as electives. Um, about half of their enrollment has been through kinesiology majors. When, I'm sorry, my apologies. When I had my meeting with my fellow CEOs last night, I was supposed to go from four to five, it went to from four to seven. So we talked a lot about 928. And there's pretty strong consensus that that the horse has, has, has left the barn on this one. That there really isn't a lot that a community college right now can say to impact what it finally looks like. All we have to do is get ready for either passage or not, but I think that we're on our way, as, uh, as President Gaines had men has mentioned before, is that we are getting the faculty ready to make those changes when this, when this law is actually approved and signed in. I do have a couple of questions. So courses that appear as part of a major, does, does that mean necessarily they will be offered or it depends? So there are courses that are required as part of their major right. and then there are courses that are right. one of the options. Right. So all the ones that are listed in area E, I believe are optional, but they do count towards their degree. But there are some elective units they would have to take to fulfill that major. Correct. So, okay. And you actually, you would hit on the challenge that the Senate and the faculty now have is to go through each degree and decide which one is going to fit within our future degree pattern and which one is are not. Um, Another question, uh, uh, well, two more questions. One, on, uh, on the GS1, particularly as, uh, I mean, this is a great course, first of all, <laughs> but, but um, as, a, as it applies to Pelican Bay State Prison, does that make a difference? Are they still, are we still in the position of may not be able to offer that course anymore? I don't have that answered. Um, do you have an answer for that one, <clears throat> Crystal, by chance? We could still offer the course. Uh, Matthews, it would simply be that it's an elective course within right. a non transferable degree program. Right. Uh, 
know, the counseling department is certainly looking at other options. Mm -hmm. And all of our full-time faculty counselors need to be and this has been on the radar. Mm -hmm. How can we shift and what can we do to still be able to provide these valuable skills that a course like this provides mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't add to the burden of units and, and doesn't take us out of compliance? We don't have an answer yet. Okay. Uh, the statewide discussion, listening, and we're open. For first generation students, perhaps, and certainly with Pelican Bay and the lack of their educational background sometimes coming into this, I just see that as being <coughs> a loss. Um, can I keep my last question before I forget what it is? <laughs> my last question is. Um, the, the pattern has also added the ethnic studies requirement. Is this, but this isn't really going to affect the loss of these. Isn't that an additional requirement on the pattern? Yes, it is. So would we perhaps be picking up enrollments in that course from students who would have had this course before or these courses before? Potentially, yes. Thank you. Kelly. Um, you had mentioned in the CEO's call that everybody kind of had a consensus that the horse has left the barn. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, I mean, could there be no wiggle room to try to, I mean, we have such a great relationship with our local um, Cal Poly Humboldt. And I, I know that you work hard to establish these relationships with other colleges. I just wish that there was some more wiggle room in here for the colleges and their local community colleges to negotiate these things. Has that been explored? Is there we, any ability to do that? We have. But, and we also have to keep in mind that this, this is driven by the UC. And, and the legislature doesn't have oversight of the UCs. They're independent. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> Another comment I would make is that this is also part, I believe, of, of melding the CSU and UC transfer requirements, general ed transfer requirements. And this is really a huge advantage to our students and really an advantage to the college, um, in, in my opinion. So there's some plus and minus to the whole thing, but there is a great deal of advantage to students of combining those pro those general requirements, and they're not trying to say, well, I have to meet this list and this list and this list, and they're all different, slightly different, and that won't be the case. And that really is, and that's a movement on those systems to do that. Um, Trustee Dorn. I was just going to make a comment. It's really a shame that GS classes. Um, it, it actually changed the life of my eldest daughter when she took it here and then decided that she wanted to become an RN. And she's now an RN for four years at Pace. That was, you know, it's a shame to see that program uh, maybe mm -hmm. in here mm -hmm. or that class. Well, and just to piggyback on, and the cost of this class, uh, these classes, these courses that done at the UC, I mean, can't compete with community college. So, how that going to impact students? You know? and, and I think that's that's where you hit where the problem is. Is that on the one on the one hand, this is actually good for students in terms of getting them through. But it's, on the other hand, it, it's bad for students from the other end, from a lifelong learning perspective. So exactly, how would one advocate for 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 the students to have the lifelong learning option, or for students to be able to get through our curriculum? and transfer to CSU and UC. I was just, uh, yes. so I've been in conversations around this uh, on Cal Poly Humboldt, so the same thing as removal of the Area E, and some of the discussions that we're having are infusing some of the other GE courses with that Area E curriculum, mm -hmm. um, and so that it's not lost because it is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, the financial burden to do that is going to be on the community college who just lost the 
to the woman. So, mm -hmm. True. <laughs> thanks again. Any other comments, Mr. Chow? <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you for thank you for bringing information to us. Um, and we come to 6.2, Child Development Center Self-Evaluation Report. It's also an information item. President Flamer. Julie, is Wendy Hill on? Wendy, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Hi, Tim. Okay. Wonderful. Thank Hi, you for everybody. joining us. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. It's nice to see everyone. Um, Basically, this is um, information for you to let you know where we are and where we're setting goals for the year. Uh, we are required to do program self-evaluations based on parent surveys, environmental rating scales, um, developmental assessments for the children here in the program, plus other outside um, entities um, do evaluations for us, such as CLASS, which is all about the classroom environment um, and how the teachers communicate with the children. So all of these different um, assessment outcomes come into us um, setting our goals. And through this last year, we are meeting all of the goals that we've set when it comes to um, increasing classroom environments, um, <clears throat> providing more um, family events face-to-face, um, this last year, all of our events that we put on were um, very well attended. We um, have also started doing our TGIF and parent advisory face-to-face -face here um, at the center, and they are also being very well attended, um, especially for this fall. We've had um, a great increase in our enrollment here at the center, but we're still not quite back to pre-COVID levels. Um, some of that is due to um, finding qualified staff for the positions that we have open because we, we will need, hopefully, um, we've had some positions out for the last six months or so, but we've been having a really hard time finding qualified staff. Um, so that has a little bit to do with um, us being under-enrolled. Um, but we're working on and will continue to search for qualified applicants. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Fine. So basically, um, I just hopefully you guys got um, a chance to read over this report and I'm here to answer any questions if you have any. Trustee Robertson. I'm wondering what the enrollment is and what, um, how much below capacity you are at this point, um, and if you have a waiting list. Yes, pre pre COVID levels were right around um, 75. Right now, we are enrolled at um, 52. We. Um, have a waiting list, uh, but, but due to the staffing, we. Um, have to enroll to the teachers we have available. So um, hopefully we'll get those qualified teachers in so we can increase our enrollment. I have a question. Maybe the answer is obvious, but um, why, why are we having such a hard time finding qualified applicants? Well, it's not just a Humboldt <laughs> County issue. It's actually a nationwide issue. I and one of our colleagues were at a conference um, recently, and um, it's we have a shortage. There is a shortage of people coming into the EC field. A lot of people retired, as you may know from other um, entities involved in education. So we've had a real um, kind of flip-flop in our availability to um, have qualified um, ECE um, professionals coming in. Well, so you would we would go through College of the Redwoods. You know, a lot of people weren't able to attend labs due to classroom caps and things like that. So, and that is a required class. 
Um, so that's part of it. Part of it is just access for students. Some of it is the field itself. Um, it would be great if we had more promotion for people to come into our field. Um, and then again, it's it's a national issue as well for child care. Thank you. Yes. So thank you for the report and congratulations on all that you're doing. In terms of these ECE units, are they readily available if one chooses to get these ECE units so that they're qualified? Yes, the, the classes are available and it's um, everything that they need is put out through the state of California um, Commission on Teacher Credentialing. So there are specific requirements for um, those who work in our field who can be in a classroom with children. Uh, CR does provide those classes. Um, ECU 1, 2, 5, and 7 are the basic critical 12 units for an assistant teacher in our programs. So, so why do you think um, folks are, who may be interested in this field are, are, are not getting these necessary units? Is there a cost involved? There, there is definitely um, a cost involved, and it's really about... I don't know. It kind of gets a little political for me, just to be honest, because we do have um, TK coming up, the traditional kindergarten, which is um, really um, promoting um, and have a lot more support um, to funnel students into the uh, public education system. Um, the ECE field for our age group isn't seeing that um, kind of support and promotion for our ECE programs, and and for some people, it's 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 the wages as well. Um, our ECE programs um, do not support as much of a livable wage as the uh, TK through 12 programs do. And so those um, are also barriers to finding qualified staff. So if one were to, let's say, come up with some type of, like, I'll call it a scholarship for lack of a better word right now, for individuals who are interested in taking these ECE courses, would that be much of an incentive if we could provide some funding to help people become qualified? You know, I really think that that is a, a wonderful idea and would be a great step forward in promoting the ECE programs. Okay. Maybe that's something the foundation would like to think about as a scholarship opportunity. So, thank you. Thank you for the idea. Are there any other questions or, or comments? Um, Thank you for the report. Thank you for all the success with your program. Um, the scholarship idea. And, and I think uh, promoting people getting into the field and, and also we, we know that, um, that the, the wage level for that as opposed to other early childhood education publicly funded programs yeah. um, is, is an issue also. So thank you. All right, thank you. We move on now to organizational reports. Uh, Academic Senate President Gaines. Yes, hello. Thank you for having me today and us at the as the Senate. I wanted to uh, start with the report related to your discussion about AB 928. Um, we've spent as I think you know well, because my previous reports have emphasized that a lot of the semester has been uh, discussing as a faculty, not just within Senate, but also uh, as a total faculty about um, the implications of AB 928. Um, it started with a conversation about the ethnic studies requirement and it evolved to uh, become a, a general education guiding direction discussion. Um, so I believe that uh, VPI uh, Carrie Mayer will include this in her report as well. And she was a 
really great partner in this discussion, um, but I wanted to uh, highlight to you uh, where faculty have ended uh, the semester. Uh, we have approved uh, what we're calling a guiding direction for GE. Um, the curriculum committee chair, uh, previous chair, Sean Thomas, and the current chair, George Patamianos, were just incredible guides at getting us to a place where faculty have now agreed that uh, CR should establish two GE pathways for our students, um, one being the local GE pathway as it currently, uh, we have one now, uh, we think we should keep it, that was one of our choices to look at, um, and then uh, the Cal Getze pathway, which you've discussed um, pretty extensively today. Um, the GE pathway should be no more than 21 units, including the ethnic studies requirement, of course, uh, and should ensure that every course option in GE included in the CR or local pathway be fully approved in the same corresponding area in the Cal Getze pathway. So that's actually a pretty significant change as a guiding direction for our faculty uh, that our local pattern uh, matches to the best of our ability with the corresponding Cal Getze pathway. And I heard um, your trustee conversation a moment ago uh, mentioned how that is to benefit our students wherever possible to make their pathway clear and well-defined. Um, in addition to that, we're encouraging faculty to audit their current programs uh, to wherever possible be no more than uh, 60 units in total. Uh, and also uh, where there are current courses uh, required by the Cal Getze pattern to reevaluate at a course level where unit values may be able to be reduced to not only uh, meet the requirements, but also to make the, um, the unit values as low as possible for our students. And so, you know, that, that may seem like a very simple uh, guiding direction that we've come to, but it involved a significant amount of conversation and dialogue about the implications. And you discussed many of those today. Um, where we go from here, in the spring is that our ASPC committee will start to create policies based upon this guiding direction. And you will be seeing uh, policy recommendations uh, from us in the near future. Uh, as you remember, we need to be operational on these uh, by fall of 2024. Uh, and so the work needs to begin immediately to meet that deadline. Other than that, um, kind of major highlight of the semester, uh, we have a few other quick uh, updates and then I'll wrap it up. Um, we've been working very closely with the Guided Pathways Initiative and, and, and Nicole and, sh and her committee. And we see that as strengthening and ongoing in the spring. That's been um, a lot of fruitful dialogue uh, and, and uh, we're excited about that. We have been working with the President's Council to promote faculty innovation and to create a strong working relationship uh, between faculty and the community leaders on that panel. And so far it's been a really, really awesome uh, conversation and we hope to continue that. Uh, we've been updating and improving uh, as much as possible our constitution and bylaws to We've been focusing a lot on uh, the recruitment and development of future leaders. And for the spring, uh, we're going to continue to focus on the EMP with specific emphasis on DE&I uh, and a focus uh, around operationalizing those goals. Um, Vice President Diana Herrera has now taken an interim role in uh, chairing the MDC. I wanna not only thank her for that, but she's also in the process of rebuilding the membership of that committee. And we're looking forward to, to that in the spring, um, the outcomes from that committee. We're going to very much focus on digital education and the future of education. And I'm sure that some of you um, have already played around with the chat GPT 
AI models and things uh, of that nature. If you haven't, um, you might want to check that out. We're definitely going to start talking about um, those really interesting trends in education uh, in the spring and implications on uh, 10 plus one issues. And finally, um, we will be emphasizing uh, faculty culture, rebuilding campus and virtual communities. Um, in, in final, I just wanted to thank uh, VPI Carrie Mayer. I also wanted to make sure that the board is well aware that she's just been an amazing collaborator, incredibly collegial, and very supportive uh, of the Senate and our work. And I know that we're excited to get a new uh, VPI here in a couple months, but um, I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned that as well. That, Thank that's you. In her today. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any comments or questions from trustees? Thank you, Professor Gaines. Thank you. Uh, our report uh, from CRFO. Excuse me, President Michelle Haggerty, welcome. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here in person. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's finals week, and of course, we all are very busy. Uh, faculty throughout the county are hunkered down in rooms uh, doing their grading very quietly. Um, you know, a lot of faculty are struggling with some of the things that we're struggling with in, in the world with our students. Um, if you've read any reports in recent years or recent months, you've heard about the, the learning loss that's occurring in K through 12 is where it's well documented. Um, the, the reports that I'm reading are saying that economically disadvantaged students are more learning, losing more ground than individuals with more resources. And so those are the students that we typically get at CR, and um, a lot of us are really struggling with do you change your grading scales, do you change your late policies, you know, what type of things do you do to, um, you know, help these students. So it's kind of some soul searching that all of us are doing while we're doing um, our grading right now. You've also heard about the mental health issues of students, and of course, we're dealing with that in the classroom, and learning loss is really embedded with the mental health issues, too. Um, Survey Monkey is something that CRFO has been using for a while to, to collect information from our faculty. Um, we want to make sure that we're not just listening to a few voices, but that we get uh, information from across the board, and I've presented some things in the past. We have a couple surveys out right now, one on technology. Um, technology, of course, has been significantly important to us in the last couple of years, uh, switching to online and all of that work that we've done. Um, so we want to see how that's going for everybody. Um, so we have a variety of questions, and uh, some of the issues are CRFO related, some of them are Senate related, some of them are admin related, and so we'll share the results. Um, when that comes in, we're going to keep it open until the beginning of next semester because we know faculty are really busy right now. We have another survey out on compensation, and that um, got really significant response from faculty very quickly. Um, so some of the preliminary, I'll just tell you some of the themes that I got out of that. Um, our faculty are really feeling the pinch, all of us are, right, from the cost of living increases. Um, so that was just highlighted throughout, um, and the increase in work that they're feeling they need to do with um, some of the challenges we faced in the last few years. CRFO uh, does general membership meetings, and we are not bound by the own act, so we've been using Zoom for those, and we actually get a greater turnout, so that's been nice. We're trying to figure out, as an organization, how to to create community, I know that's something we've all been talking about, um, and how to talk to more individuals. So we're actually um, talking about doing a social media page for the organization, um, not TikTok yet, so <laughs> <laughs> maybe Instagram, and, and trying to look for some uh, faculty who are well aware of how to do that. Um, and then next semester, we're planning some brown bag sessions on different topics for that faculty are interested in, um, trying to kind of figure out how to what people want and how to keep people engaged. Um, I continue to work on the 
Faculty Association for Community Colleges. It's been a little bit quieter in the last month. Um, I am on the Legislative Committee and we've been meeting and are working on some bills and we're working with the, the California Community College Independence Group on that too. Um, so the advocate for FAC that was just wonderful, she was there for four years and she, she left in November and is working now for the student group, which is great that they have such a wonderful advocate, but um, there's a little <coughs> delay in what FAC can handle as a result of that. Eric Kramer and I have a meeting scheduled with Mike McGuire at the beginning of January. We were supposed to meet with him in November and he had to cancel. Um, it'll be a Zoom meeting and we've, I went to ASDR last week and just kind of informed them of some of the work that we're doing. We decided it would be good to include them more in, in the work that we're doing and partner with them. And so they're interested in coming to these meetings with us. I think it's just great. I've just asked students in different groups and classes, like, what do you think your state senator should know about your experience here? And, you know, it's just great for students to feel that sense of empowerment and some connection with what's going on at the state level. So we're going to do that more formally with ASPR. I wish you all a happy holidays and thank you all for the work that you do for our college. Thank you. Thank you. Your questions. Thank you, President Haggerty. Uh, we move now to our uh, classified report. President Tammy Ingman. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to start off today by welcoming new trustee Lorraine Pedrotti. Um, it is exciting to have a former classified staff member serve as a board of trustee. Um, CSCA as a statewide organization has a long standing, very strong tradition of um, seeking out and helping promote classified friendly trustees. Um, so we know that Lorraine is going to do a great job um, given her history that she's had with the college. So welcome to Lorraine. Um, on another note, in October and November, uh, classified staff held nominations for um, chapter officers for the positions of communications secretary and chapter president. Um, I'm very pleased and happy to report that everyone who is currently serving um, was nominated and accepted their uh, accepted their nominations. We had some other people that were nominated that declined. But um, Bryn Allen will continue to serve for the next two years as our communications officer. Esmeralda Ramirez will continue to serve for the next two years as chapter secretary. And I will continue to serve for the next two years as chapter president. Um, just keeping my report very brief this month. And um, I wish you guys all very happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will be happy to be hearing from you again. Uh, we move on to Management Council and President Eric Sorensen. Welcome. Uh, I submitted my <clears throat> report um, online this month, and I'm here to answer any questions. Or if you'd like, I could run through a couple of highlights. What would you highlight? Well, let's see, I would highlight that um, the LRC uh, has a new batch of uh, laptop computers, so we'll have more um, resources for the students next semester, which will be good um, to loan out uh, for those who uh, do not have uh, equipment at home. Um, marketing is in the process of the spring enrollment marketing drive. Um, they hired a student worker um, to assist with distribu uh, distribution of information through our social media drive. Uh, residential housing is anticipating a full enrollment uh, in the residential semester. Uh, the career center is uh, getting ready to uh, <coughs> start a new job board to replace our current job board and it's more in line with what's already in the Holy Humboldt and some of the other colleges across the state. So uh, we're eager to get that going for them. Uh, he also is open for applications, uh, payroll uh, for all the faculty and staff and increases of all the new apps. So I know that means. Uh, information technology for my corner of the world. Um, we've uh, completed the wireless Wi-Fi uh, 
phase one of our improvement on the campus, which was um, replacing all our outdated and old gear with new equipment. With newer technology, um, before the semester starts, we are now going back and we're hitting some areas where um, we still have a little bit of um, over saturation during the two main devices trying to connect at one time. So we're working through that. We have got that part completed by the spring. Um, easy to take care of. And then once the weather gets better, we'll start working on Wi-Fi uh, more outdoor areas. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Eric, where on, on the outdoor Wi-Fi, where would it be placed outdoors, and what's the focus? Well, the focus is for uh, student engagement. Uh, so, some of the outdoor areas would be like outside the uh, cafe, uh, one area outside between the um, humanities and science building, being out there. Um, so, access over closer to the bus stop and the uh, food court area, the new trailer, and also for the farm stand. Mm -hmm. We look at areas um, to cover outside of the um, arts building, the creative arts building, so some quad area there will be covered. Mm -hmm. And we'll get, um, we can make it happen, uh, get some of the. If, if I can encourage you to also talk to uh, Karen Rice and see if there's some Wi Fi access where the OCC trail. Mm -hmm. We'll go down the road. I don't know the timing with that, but that may be. Yeah, I had that in my head as a, as a wish list item. So maybe we can do that. I'm thinking maybe we can come off the cafe and at least maybe provide some wire loss over around the pond area and some of those areas. I'll definitely be able to So in the, in the spring, we're hope, uh, because we just put it all in, in the spring, I'll be, um, we'll be putting together a, a survey for the students and faculty and staff, and then we'll hopefully we'll put it on there like where we store So for the student housing, are you doing COVID um, occupancy rates or are you doing pre-COVID occupancy? Question I don't know. I'm just wondering, are you doing two? Because at COVID, you cut it in half, if I remember correctly, occupancy didn't We did, yeah. So that's why I'm curious if we're full, is it we, at what occupancy, whether it's one student in a room or two? It depends upon what they're asking for. So if, if they want single, of course that's single, and if they want double, then we're okay with that too. Right now we are setting some rooms aside for like COVID, COVID rooms, but moving forward, we, we just have to learn to live with COVID at this point, so we'll make adjustments as we move. That answered you? No. <laughs> so, we, so then, why don't you ask your question in a different way? So what's the occupancy rate in, in, a, in, the, in the room? Is it a double or a COVID single? You're, they can buy a single room now? I'm going to refer to someone who actually runs that program. Dr. Morris, can you give us? Okay. Absolutely, sir. So we are running at full occupancy in the residence halls for the fall 22 term and planning to maintain at the same level for spring 23. That means double occupancy for each side of the quad. We have very few students who have elected to have a single room. We kept four rooms offline for COVID and transit uh, transit rooms for maybe Hoopa students who have to travel to Del or to uh, Eureka or Del Mar students traveling to Eureka and need overnight stay. Otherwise, we're max capacity. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. And then before I leave, I'd like to welcome Lorraine. Uh, good to see you, <laughs> Matt and Karen. And I uh, wish you all a happy holiday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, student trustee Madsen with us? She is not with she us. Is not. Okay. But her report is included. Right. At your place. Right. Okay. Uh, we move on then to uh, administrative report. Uh, the first would be President Flame. Thank you. After four years plus, we now have the, the demolition of the life science and physical science buildings almost complete. And we're hopefully that we will be through that within the next three, four weeks. Is that, is that correct, Vice President Morrison? We close? <laughs> Six weeks. Six. We're still thinking on my part, but <laughs> at least right now it's finally happening. So that, that will, will will complete the the demo project. We started with creative art. No, we we started with the old library. Now we have life science, physical science, and when the new creative arts building is built, then we will start the demolition of the old creative arts building. So it's starting to to really come across, and it's good to have this project. Finally, almost complete within the next six weeks. I completed. But also on on the part of the of CR, I would like to 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 congratulate Cal Poly Humboldt's rugby team for <laughs> their national win. Yes. So this is this this is absolutely wonderful, and they beat Wayne State by 20 to 15, I mm. believe. I think that was the, was the final score. So great job, our partners in Cal Poly Humboldt. But also my, my final comment is that we're not quite done with this board meeting. But I wanted to thank you, uh, Carol Matthews, for being the, the board president. And it's been very stable. And I really appreciate your insight and your wisdom. And you will be missed. I did not want to adjourn the meeting without thanking you for what you've done for us. Thank you. Uh, we move to Vice President of Instruction, Mary Mayer. She is off so, campus today. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me rephrase. <laughs> good for her. Good for her. <laughs> okay. Vice President of Administrative Services, Julia Morris. <laughs> Thank you. The only thing I will add to my report is in regard to the facilities master plan update. Um, as part of the effort, TVP Architecture, which is our consultant helping us with the facilities master plan update, they are also uh, been very involved in a lot of our capital outlay projects. They are also going to be assisting the college with a feasibility study for the stadium upgrade, um, starting off first with uh, looking at the current football field and trying to make an assessment to um, whether upgrading to a natural field that um, of higher quality or moving to that or artificial turf will be a better option. So I'm be making some progress on that. Any questions or comments? What what are some of the issues in the choice between Natural field and mm -hmm. oh, artificial field. Well, you, uh, you, they're going to help us look at the total cost of ownership for both options, as well as um, we'll also have to do some testing of the the uh, soil and drainage to make sure that it can support a turf field. Um, things along those lines. Other than that, I haven't been too involved yet. It's not really my area of expertise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Vice President of Student Services, Dr. Crystal Morris, welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to report out. Um, I would just like to thank the board for approving the new contract for the Arcata House and College of the Redwoods Partnership. This is a valuable and huge step forward in offering third-party case management services and housing stabilization for our CR student community. 
I, I hope if you haven't taken the opportunity, you do have some time to look over that MOU and look at some of the other amazing support services available. Uh, the partnership liaison will be located on campus and will travel to sister campuses as well as do remote work in that uh, liaison work to get students connected to their housing. We went official on the contract on Thursday afternoon, mm -hmm. and in that time frame, we've had the opportunity to house mm -hmm. seven students and wow. families. Wow. One of which, and I think this is a really critical element, uh, we included in this contract a safe house for our fleeing uh, domestic violence victims and survivors uh, at an undisclosed location. I think it just really goes to show how much our community is willing to help us support our student population. Do you have any questions? Uh, Trustee Kelly. Thank you, I just wanted to comment about the um, Kid House um, partnership as well. The, um, also the ability to house families, right? Uh, so at our dorms, we can't do that. And it was a, it's a crucial uh, service that our community college is providing that other community colleges are really struggling with as they're coming up with housing needs now. So uh, we're talking about college and what we're doing. Thank you. This is, this is phase two of a three-part uh, endeavor on, this, on the part of student services to help with the long-term uh, housing issues and concerns that we face as a community. I will highlight that uh, my colleague Marty Quinello and I have also been working and collaborating closely with the Reviving the Redwood Room and Board Scholarship Program. Um, and we've We've had a, an entire group of students who applied for the scholarship for spring 23. The committee has met to review those applicants and we're moving to interview on those that we can place. Those that were unable to place in the dorms are automatic referrals for the Arcade House Partnership. Thank you. And our Executive Director of College Advancement and the Foundation Marty Quello. Good afternoon. I'd like to elaborate on one point in my report, which is on the Innovation Awards. So this was the first semester we awarded Presidential Innovation Grants. We had eight applications for, for academic innovation and four for economic development. Foundation Innovation Grants Committee elected to award three academic grants and two economic grants. In addition, we asked for two economic grant applications to be reviewed by the Office of Instruction for a potential reapplication in the spring. In regard to the academic grants, the Foundation awarded forestry professor Valerie Elder, $5,000 to develop a peer-reviewed carbon offset pilot project, which will teach students skills in estimating carbon capture in our forest and partners with Cal Poly Humboldt in their carbon estimation efforts. This potentially could lead to CR trading its carbon capture in credits. The foundation also awarded biology professor Karen Rice, $5,000, to expedite the online database for the CR Natural History Collection and offer up on the publicly available ARCTOS system, A-R-C-T-O-S system, where researchers could request our items for research or local K-12 classes could request items to display in their classes. Hmm. The foundation also awarded English professor Ruth Rhodes $5,000 to hire Grove Consultants International to create a story map of the responsibilities of full-time faculty member and how their responsibilities tie into the education master plan. As for the Presidential Innovation Grant applications, the Foundation requested the Office of Instruction to review two of the proposals. One proposal was from Mark Delaney, a community member who represents the company True Seal a company that constructs buildings out of styrofoam blocks, and Home Contained, who builds homes out of steel shipping containers. The proposal offers potential partnerships with our CR Construction Technology Program to train our faculty in using these unique materials for construction. The other proposal sent to the Office of Instruction for a review 
was from Sally McComas, Associate Nursing Faculty, who had proposed the launching of a second cohort of nursing students during summer session and utilizing support from Providence St. Joseph Health System and nurses with master degrees for faculty support. The two presidential innovation grants that were awarded were a $50,000 grant to Lost Coast Ventures to provide entrepreneur mentorship to see our faculty, students, and staff. The funds will be used directly to fund deserving entrepreneurs associated with our college. The foundation is also looking at funding CR faculty member Trevor Hartman from the Computer Information Systems faculty and Matthew Sendejas, one of our business faculty, a $15,000 grant to create a pipeline of e-commerce entrepreneurs who possess the skills to build new, innovate, and environmentally responsible businesses. Hartman and Zendejas will supply additional detail back to the foundation in January for final review. I want to thank the CR Presidential Innovations Grant Committee for their time and efforts. The committee included Dan Collin, who is our foundation board president. He is the retired athletics director for Humboldt State. Dr. Jason Ramos, the tribal council member and chairman for Blue Lake Rancheria's Gaming Commission and foundation board member. Dr. Colby Smart, the Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services for the Humboldt County Office of Education and Foundation Board Member. Fred Robinson, Financial Advisor for Edward Jones and Foundation Board Member. And Dr. Kinte Johnson, our Director of our Multicultural and Equity Center. Any questions? Oh. <laughs> Trustee Dorn. On a different subject, I just wanted to say thank you, uh, Trustee Bingham, for passing this around. It's actually the first time I've seen uh, naming outside of the boardroom, um, a mention of being able to name a facility or a field, and so I thought that was really good. Um, yeah, part of the Redwoods Championship Club. Yeah, no, I really thought the whole breakdown of this, you know, I've never seen, I don't know if anybody else has, but I've never seen publicly that you can name a building. I mean, we all know it here but outside of this room, I'm not sure how many people know that. So I was impressed by that. Any other comments, questions? Trustee Biggin. I'd like to uh, thank the foundation and especially Marty for um, all the work you did to promote this event. And I, I'm assuming uh, you and probably um, you know, a lot of this behind the scenes stuff, getting everything together. And, <laughs> <laughs> there were t-shirts for sale and just a lot of excitement there. And I um, wanted to publicly thank you for it. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Appreciate it. And we got some good support from our marketing communications department. So, yeah, we had about two weeks and one of those weeks was Thanksgiving week. So. <laughs> Um, it was an interesting uh, texting session behind the scenes for quite a while. Thank you. Um, we move now to um, agenda uh, number nine, feature agenda items, reports, requests for information. Trustee Robertson? Yes, I'd like to request an um, inform informational report on the district student advising as well as academic and mental health support services. And, and that might be more than one <laughs> because I recognize that that is. So a report looking at what what advising is offered, staffing? So the, what? The, I think the advising model as well as what the staffing is, how many students are being served, um, what the points of contact are, what the process is for advising, um, and similarly for academic and mental health support. Okay. Um, do the trustees concur with being interested in that information? And I would also ask President Flamer what what a reasonable. Very very reasonable. Yeah. Okay. Um, would this necessarily be? A, a January look, or, or we, are we, we looking more time? We already have um, the mental health support in January. Oh, January. Okay. And we, we, can, we can schedule it. Right. 
So with the concurrence of the board? Very good. Thank you. So we now will be moving into closed session and disclose uh, those items to uh, be discussed in closed session. Uh, one, conference with Labor Negotiator Employee Organization, CRFO, Dr. Jack Miyamoto. And second, Public Employee Discipline Dismissal Release under Government Code Section 54957B. Any public comment regarding this? Uh, then we will adjourn to closed session and we will take a five-minute break.